Okay, so I uh, want to uh, welcome uh, everyone back and welcome uh, some of the uh, new people who have just signed on as well. Uh, once again, my name is Miles Budimir. I'm the uh, senior editor here at uh, Design World Magazine. And I want to welcome everybody to this uh, special webinar today um, entitled uh, The Energy Efficient Factory, Everything You Need to Know About Smart Energy Management. And uh, we will uh, go ahead and get, uh, get started here. Uh, prior to starting, just a few uh, housekeeping points to mention uh, up front here. So uh, this webinar uh, will be uh, available afterwards at that uh, web link that you see there, uh, designworldonline.com. And also, if you, uh, everybody who's registered for the webinar will also get a copy of the webinar in their email as well. Uh, at the end of uh, the presentation today, we will have a uh, Q&A session. And uh, you can, at, at, uh, at any time during the webinar, you can submit questions as well. And then uh, we will try to get through uh, as many of those questions as we can. And lastly, uh, if you are on Twitter, using Twitter, uh, you can also uh, tweet about this webinar in real time using that hashtag uh, DWWebinar as well. So feel free to, to uh, do that uh, as well. So um, with that, then, I will uh, uh, do a brief uh, introduction of our two um, presenters today. Um, first presenter will be David Cayley. Uh, a little bit about David. He is a uh, business development manager at Mitsubishi um, Electric, and he is focused on the food and beverage and consumer product manufacturing space. Um, David has over 20 years of automation experience, and he's worked on the factory floor, uh, done field service, product engineering, and product management uh, throughout his uh, career. Uh, he has a technical degree in electronics from the U.S. military and a business degree from uh, Concordia University. Uh, and then our, our, our other presenter is Gregory Maloney, and he is a sustainability solutions engineer at um, Iconics. He, uh, he has supported uh, Iconics with system architecture and dashboard creation for a number of successful sustainability projects. Uh, his background includes an uh, electrical engineering degree as well as an MBA from the University at Buffalo. So uh, that's a little bit about our two uh, presenters for today. And I believe our first presenter will be uh, David Cayley. So I think we will uh, advance the, the presentation here. And uh, we will get, uh, get Dave started here. So Dave, I think uh, you can take it away. All right. Thank you, Miles. Everybody hear me OK, I'm sure. So uh, effective energy management, there's a a um, lot out there, a lot of people talking about it nowadays. Um, it certainly, um, I'm having a technical issue here, guys. So, um, Miles, there we go, slides and dancing. So everybody's talking about uh, energy management and all the different strategies. You know, this has been going on for years. Um, trying to understand, you know, how much energy you can save. I mean, everybody's changed up their light bulbs already, and people are looking at HVAC solutions and insulation and that sort of thing. But really, at the manufacturing level, it's a little bit different. And so I'm going to give a little presentation. Um, you know, I work for Mitsubishi. We're an automation supplier. Um, us, like all the other automation suppliers, have solutions um, that will help a, a factory to be able to manage their energy consumption and understand their energy consumption. But before you can really understand your consumption, it's a good idea just to review the uh, utility bill structure. And trying to get the slide to advance again, and it's not advancing. There we go. Uh, this is kind of a, a mock-up of a bill here. But what I wanted to um, highlight um, five key elements on the bill. Um, for which you can actually see on this mock-up bill if you can read it. But the first is the uh, when you look at an energy bill, there's your energy consumption charges. That's basically um, the the consumption or energy charge. That's how much energy you used in that billing period. So it's kind of like the odometer on your car. Um, it's how many miles you went. You know, so it's your total energy usage, and that uh, that constitutes the bulk of most bills. It's around seventy percent of the bill, give or take. 10% depending on your utility. Um, I skipped over the first point I wanted to bring, and that was your rate schedule or your rate tariff. 
this is a little understood, misunderstood part of uh, um, energy bills and very, very important to manufacturers. And that is that the uh, the rate schedule, um, all the, most of the utilities, I should say all the utilities have many different rate schedules depending on the type of customer. And if your facility gets um, classified as the wrong type of customer, you may be paying too much. Uh, we've actually worked with a couple of customers already and without doing anything other than um, changing their rate schedule, help them realize, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar a year savings. The uh, moving on to the uh, demand or the capacity charge. This is um, no, no, not the slide, please. Demand or capacity charge is kind of like you know, using that uh, car analogy again. Um, this is the speed you go. This is how much your your peak energy usage. We always hear that you know we're getting billed at a peak rate, whatever our peak is, so we need to control our peaks. Um, that's what the demand or the capacity charge is. And I'll get into that a little more later in the presentation. And then lastly, not shown here, some utilities charge a power factor um, charge or a penalty for the power factor charge. And power factor is, you know, it's like when a, when a um, large active load, like a motor or something starts up, um, when it's first starting, there's a bunch of energy noise that ends up going back into the system. It's kind of like uh, the froth on your beer. You know, when you sit at the, the bartender pours the beer and some of the froth has to go down into the drain, well, the utility charges to dispose of that froth. Now we can go for a slide. Energy management um, really takes a commitment right from the beginning, and it takes a commitment from senior management. And you know, ISO 9001 and ISO 14001, we've heard of those. Well, now we have ISO 50001. And ISO 50001 is very much the same as 9000 and 14000 in that it's a, um, it's a documented process by which your company will um, continue to look to ways to save energy and reduce their energy usage. And I would uh, definitely recommend, if you're not familiar with the 50001, um, that you take a look at it in the near future and as a means, as a methodology for managing your energy usage. Because we, we all say we want to do it, but if we don't put a commitment in place, um, we probably won't actually do it for a long period of time. Slide, please. Energy audits, pretty much any energy plan after you get your management commitment needs to start with an audit. And that audit is, gives you a baseline, and it gives you, um, really, it gives you an idea of where you can go save money. So you've got, uh, there's, there's different uh, places out there saying different ways, different levels of audits. ASHRAE has level zero through three or four audits. But in a nutshell, um, an audit starts with a billing analysis, which I mentioned a little bit ago. That's where we're looking at your rates, um, what you're paying, how much your bill is, who you're buying it from. And then the next step is to actually monitor the facility. Uh, monitoring can be done at a, at a whole building level, um, which gives you, you know, that's basically your monthly bill, right? So that's probably not really what you want to do. You probably want to monitor a little more discreetly. You want to figure out, you know, what the offices are using, what the factory is using. You may want to monitor right down to the line or right down to, you know, a steam generator or a boiler or something like that. After a period of monitoring, um, a professional organization will provide recommendations on how you can save energy. You know, uh, years ago we all had the guys coming in selling light bulbs. You know, let's go to cheaper light bulbs, and you know, um, that that was a really good energy savings. But we have to go beyond that. And uh, if you're working with a um, uh, an ESCO or an engineering firm. They're probably going to provide you an estimated savings and an expected time to your return on investment, because there is going to be an investment. And where do you get an energy audit? I always recommend starting with your energy utility company. Every utility out there has a, um, a list of engineering firms and ESCOs in the area that can provide audits. And in many cases, those audits are paid for by the utility itself. I know where I am here in Illinois, Commonwealth Edison um, will pay for the audits assuming that the customer is, um, will invest you know based on the recommendations by that come out of the audit. Um, ESCO as we've heard of them it stands for energy service company they've been around for years and years and years. Um, ESCOs oftentimes do this energy audit and the ROI and everything 
and a lot of times they'll even provide the uh, funding and financing that you might need. And then a, a kind of an odd place to go, but it is actually worth taking a look at, is the DOE, the Department of Energy. They have several different programs out there, one of which I find kind of interesting, and that is the uh, um, they're working with 26 universities across the, um, the United States. And the universities will actually um, come in and do the audit. And it's the students that come in and do that audit and then provide you with the recommendations and that sort of thing. Um, slide, please. In factory, in factory energy collection. So the, the more fine you can get your energy collection, the, the better the resolution, the better understanding you're going to have where everything's being spent. And there's you know quite a few different uh, hardware solutions out there. We certainly have several of them um, that you know most manufacturers are familiar with too because they're PLC based and they come in a panel like we're used to with an HMI. Or you may have meters right on the machine, or you may have um, a cluster of meters and then another meter taking a look at those. So really, what you're trying to do is if you can get this fine resolution, say by line. You put these meters on on the individual lines, and then you can actually start visualizing through software um, how much energy is being used, and then start taking actions towards uh, reducing that energy. Slide, please. Actually, if you go all the way down to the machine level, one of the big advantages you can get, and this is becoming more and more popular, is you can actually assign a dollar value based on the energy consumed. For in the in the example on this slide, for every cookie, um, every cookie might have a couple of pennies or a couple of fractions of a penny assigned to it as an energy value. Uh, this kind of gives you um, a really interesting performance indication of how much energy you're using, you know, based on how much product you're producing. Slide, please. Here's another um, example of what you can do within your facility. This is becoming popular as well. The term is shadow billing. And you basically, using the different metering tools, you can actually hand each department um, a monthly, ex uh, how much they used in energy in dollars. And so that department, whether it's you know the shipping or the receiving or the combination thereof or you know the process side or the packaging side or however you've got your facility broken down, you can hand each department their own bill because you've got a meter, you know, basically um, measuring how much energy they've used in that billing cycle. And then you can say, okay, your department this month used X dollars. Let's try to reduce that by 10%. What methodology is? And, you know, it kind of becomes a brainstorming at that point. Um, and you can actually get that billing information in real time as well, as Greg will probably point out with the software he's going to talk about a bit, how you can actually really start visualizing everything in real time, um, both at the moment, the shift, the week, that sort of thing. Slide, please. Of course, you know, uh, energy saving solutions, they're, they're highly variable, um, but they're very important. Remember I was talking about uh, that peak demand? If you look at this graph here and you see those um, peaks, that wherever that peak is, that period of time um, that energy was being consumed was being billed at that peak, not at the lower amount, just at the peak. So if you can manage those peaks, you can significantly reduce your energy bill. A um, very, very simple way of managing those peaks is to swap out motor starters with variable frequency drives. You know, the, the obvious thing, turning off equipment when it's not needed. Conveyors that run when there's nothing on it are a huge waste of energy. Um, power factor correction, uh, putting in equipment that either has built-in power factor correction or filtering equipment that does the power factor correction before it goes back out to the utility so that you can get charged for it. And of course, there's behavior changes. And behavior changes come from working with the people in the factory and providing them the information and the visibility um, to uh, uh, you know basically set their own um, destinies going forward as to how much energy they use. If they, if they know how much they're using in the given targets, they will more successfully reduce the energy consumption. Slide, please. A little bit more holistic approach. 
um, we were talking about uh, in the factory um, putting all the uh, different meters on and the different HMIs and you know you might go from there you go to something like the iconic solution with the SCADA software for visualizing within the factory but you can even go a little higher a uh, company that um, we're working with right now it's called power IT or power it solutions um, actually is off-site and they do um, you know cloud computing remote server um, they will actually um, analyze your energy usage and they can provide uh, two-way, they can actually help with uh, demand management solutions. And a lot of you are probably wondering what demand management is. Um, demand management is when they're monitoring in real time and they realize that, oh, you know, it's a, it's a hot day out there and the um, chillers are all running really hard and the blowers are running really hard. They can actually say, you know what, for one hour this space here is going to be a couple of degrees warmer than the rest of the building. It has a tremendous effect on saving energy over the month because getting back to that, that peak, that demand peak, if you're reducing your demand peak in real time, you're saving money over the entire month and, and a rather dramatic amount. Slide, please. So key takeaways. Um, this is wrapping up my portion of this presentation, is you know, manage your energy bill. Um, correlate those energy dollars right down to the plant floor or right down to the machine level if you like, or if you're really, really into it, right down to the product level. Uh, engage in energy audits. Um, like the, the state of New York has a law that buildings have to have an energy audit every 10 years, and I think that's starting to happen in a few other places in the country. Um, energy audits, you know, they're not hugely expensive, and the amount of money that they can save you is more than, you know, pays for itself over time. Uh, big, big thing is the energy commitment. You have to be committed to energy, and it has to come from the management and work all the way down to, you know, everybody working on their factory floor. And, you know, all of these uh, energy investments that you do can lead to incentives and tax credits as well. That's pretty much um, my portion of it. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, um, hand this over either to Miles or probably just straight to Greg. If you have questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them, and I'll be here at the end of uh, Greg's presentation. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, David. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned there, we will turn it over to Greg now. So uh, hopefully Greg is here, and uh, he will, uh, we can start on his, his part of the uh, presentation. I will. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, I'm Greg Maloney. I'm, uh, I'm calling in from Iconics. I'm going to bring you through more on the visualization side and how uh, it's really capitalized on getting access to that information and being able to make actionable decisions. See if I can get the slide going. All right, here we go. So at Iconics, what we do well, and we have a saying here as well, is we turn big data into information for real-time intelligence. But the information that we collect, it just really sits there. And if you can't really visualize or understand it or run it through some kind of algorithm to produce an action, it's meaningless. So that's what we really try to capitalize on at Iconics to really get that information out so you can make a decision. So what we typically find in a number of different deployments, anywhere from building to industry, is that you have a new uh, construction. This you can have a high degree of integration. You can get all the same systems. You can get all the universal connectivity to be able to get that information. Uh, but typically what we find out there and what we have to deal with uh, is integrating existing systems. Um, so we have disparate controls, a lot of different energy systems that we're trying to pull in. There's no single view of a campus or a facility. Uh, you got the different islands of information. And then IT or the technology has trouble buying into it because they don't really understand the solution. So the economic solution kind of comes in there and sits on top of the PLCs, the low-level uh, information systems, pulls it in and is able to do uh, real-time dashboarding visualization, uh, complex analytics, as well as big data uh, collection. And then on top of this is where the building systems would sit. So the work order, form, uh, work order forms, the uh, accounting systems would sit and be able to pull information out of us as well. So what we would do is we come in on top of the different pieces of equipment and we can connect to it. Uh, we connect, uh, being a partner of Mitsubishi, we connect solidly 
to their equipment. And then on top of that, we pull it from the different control systems and we put it into our database where we can run the analytics on it, push it to mobile devices so we can be usable on the iPhone, the Android, and all the other different systems. We can really access the information anywhere. So we need to do that with universal connectivity. So we connect via OPC. We are a fully backed uh, workstation. We connect it to the different databases and the uh, SNMP. So we can get that information and be able to visualize it. And once you get that information, you have to be able to visualize it in a meaningful sense. Now, we have a number of different programs to be able to do that, but typically, to go back one. What you need to see is the corporate energy consumption. And then you can pull it in a different way. So you can take a look at the energy cost for the cost of goods sold. You can break that down to the production type, the type of product, and then down to the individual lines. Much like Dave was saying, is the more pinpoint you can get, the more to the point you can get a lot more decisions there. So the plant energy consumption of your data is very important, as well as the product consumption. If you can get the cost of energy per revenue, you can then take a look at the different products and see what each one of those are costing in energy. So it gives you a lot of information to make action on. Now, I want to get to the point where I will be showing you a demo of one of the deployments where you can actually get a lot of this information. And a good example is a test case we did with the Microsoft Corporation on their campus over in Puget Sound. They have over 107 buildings that they needed to pull together. They have over 2 million points on the campus. They have multiple different building automation and control systems, as well as lab monitoring systems. So we had to pull in about seven different building automation systems together. So we connected to it, and I have an actual, at this point, a demo to show you guys of a snapshot of what the actual campus looks like, the deployment, our solution there. Okay, so I think what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, switch, the, uh, switch over to that, to that demo, switch over to your uh, computer there. There it is. Do you see my screen? Uh, yep, I think so. Excellent. All right into the presentation. So this here is the executive dashboard on the Microsoft campus. Now this is for the high level, the head of RE to really see and get a temperature or reading of the whole campus. Now the, some, the little backstory on it is they have five different systems. There was no way to really aggregate the data. So down here at the bottom, which is the total overall campus demand, it was impossible for him to get. He'd have to wait. He'd have to wait a few weeks to actually get a viewpoint. In. Now he can see it in real time whenever he needs it, and he can also take a look at when demand peak charges come. And this goes to what Dave was saying: is he is now able to see that he's the demand charges. And also, a little a little more background is that the Puget Sound campuses make up three percent of the total uh, energy consumption of Puget Sound Energy. So they can actually move the needle depending on how they start up. Knowing this and having a visualization into the different system is allowing the head of RNF to actually rethink how he starts up the campus, how he starts the building. And now we can kind of layer them so they don't cause a demand peak and cause more charges. So that's another good example of being able to get the visualization and have a smart decision from it. So down here, there's a number of different tools. We can zoom in on a specific time using uh, a hyperhistorian as well as pausing it and bringing it back a certain amount of time. So say something drastic happened on the campus. He can now look at what was the demand leading up to it and see if there's any problems caused that allow him to narrow down his search for any problems. We can also take this energy data and normalize it by person or square foot to help be able to compare buildings on a more layered level basis instead of just having a, a wide range. We can also look at this at per month and per, per year. Also, talking about the pinpoint drilling down and metering, Microsoft Campus has a really good metering system. They're actually able to break apart their base load, their plug load, and their lab load. Base load being the HVAC systems, the day-to-day -day operating systems of the building. The plug load would be the laptops, the coffee makers plugged in. And then the lab load is research labs, the development labs for Windows and whatnot. 
So he's able to pinpoint and break it apart. And here comes another auditing, which Dave mentioned is he can now break up and charge each department anytime he wants. Beforehand, he had to wait a quarter, every quarter, to actually put it in Excel, crunch the data. Now he can crunch it in real time and be able to generate a report whenever it's needed to be able to charge the department accurately and precisely. On the top left, we're going to get into more of that behavioral. This is the top uh, performing buildings index. They're calculated every week. And here it's tried to provide to the people on the campus a way of competing. If you're the number one building, you get X. On the flip side, he's also got the worst performing building index to help Daryl and other people working with him have a little bit more gung-ho to try to fix it and get the blood pumping. On the top right here is where the visualization comes in and the navigability. If you have the data, you need to get to it. So here we can look at the buildings. Oh, apologize. Being a click through, it has to be in a sequence of events here. So this, we can drill down in the individual base load or the plug load. Now, on the top right corner again, we can drill into the three different campuses that make up the Puget Sound campuses. We can go to the Romo campus and drill down to the individual building. We can then click on the building and open it up. Here we have the demand for that specific building. We can look at the base load, the plug load, and the lab load for that building as well as the segmentation pie chart here for that building. On the top, we have static dynamic tiles, which inform us important information about that building. It's a developer building. Important systems in that building is it has a chiller water plant for cooling and a number of labs, the square footage. Then we get into the dynamics. Microsoft is a very open, and, uh, open campus. They actually assign different rooms any time during the week. So you could be in one building for one week another building the next week. So being able to track people for energy purposes is really important. This actually updates every week with the person count for that building. So they can actually make an accurate representation of a normalization by person for the energy of the building. Then they have the demand and the outside air temperature. So that's the executive dashboard. It's a quick look to get the feel and understanding and the temperature of the campus. The next is more of an operator's set. Now, this is where the people would be working to narrow down on problems. And here, a big part of this deployment is not just energy, but also fault detection and the energy savings through fault detection. Now, to define fault detection quickly here, it's a precursor to an alarm. An alarm is a reaction. You're running around trying to save the person in a medical sense. A fault's more of you go into the doctor and he says, well, you have high cholesterol, high blood, uh, blood pressure. You need, to, uh, you need to eat right and you got to exercise. You can take precautions to prevent it from happening. Or you can fix problem equipment before it breaks down in a catastrophic event. So with that said, we've implemented different rules and have an open rule engine to be able to incorporate different rules for any piece of equipment, not just HVAC systems. So Microsoft really dug into this and tried to develop this. So that's what's going to be really in a precursor in this part of it. So on this dashboard, we have a way of navigating by, by asset, a logical list view that allows you to drill in from multiple campuses, individual campus, the building, to the floor, and to then to the equipment on the floor, or in an industry sense, to the different plants all around the world, to the assembly lines, to the individual machines. So from here, we also do the geoscatter, which is an easy ergonomic way of navigating. So we can go to the west campus and has the buildings outlined on. Here are smart tiles, these five different squares here. These connect the data points right on the back end to allow you to visualize important state information. Here is the binary state that shows whether, what the utility status is, the generation status, the comp status, whether a fault is going on behind or an alarm. This is really important to the head of, of, to the head of RNF because when a catastrophe happened, he would have to roll trucks to just see the state of the building. Now we can quickly look at this monitor and see whether a building's on and generating its own energy, whether it has a utility problem, and send the people out there to fix the problem, not to find out if there is a problem. So these all have faults going on in them. So we're going to jump into Studio C. Here again, another building-specific pop-up pops up. Here we have the semi-dynamic, semi-static, uh, semi-static tiles that are informing us of what's in the building. And we then have these tiles here and here show us the number of faults on each floor or in, in the labs. 
we can then click on a floor and pull up the different pieces of equipment on that floor, the different HTUs, UTUs, and so on, and the number of faults in each type of equipment. When we click on the type of equipment, we pull up a floor plan that has the different pieces of equipment laid on where it actually is on the floor and whether it is in a fault status. We can then click on that specific piece of equipment and pull up the information on that specific piece of equipment. We have the uh, different set points as well as the different information coming in. We can train those different set points as well as look at the faults. Now here's a fault that has gone off in this specific piece of equipment, its priority and its fault savings. So to get deeper into the faults, there's another way of viewing them in a list view, which is a little bit easier and more to the point. Instead of navigating to a specific building, which is more if someone gives you a call, you can check in on it, but to a list where you can actually filter by types of faults. So now they can look at the specific faults they know are the most costly and dive into those. Once there, they can see where the fault, what, where the piece of equipment is, what type of fault, and they can also run a fault analysis, which can show you anything from how many times this type of fault has gone off in this piece of equipment, how many times has this fault gone off in the building, how many different faults have gone off in this type of equipment, and so on. But to go on, let's go back up to the top and look at the different fault savings. Now, the fault savings is a real savings at the Microsoft campus. And a, a little of what that's been able to do, it has allowed the Microsoft campus to go into a paid performance program. Because they were actually able to prove that they've reduced the energy on campus over the time that it's been implemented. And they're also talking that it's about 80% of the savings are from this fault detection diagnostic. So what we do is we take the different faults that are occurring and we cost we take and predict how much it's going to cost if not fixed in the next year. So these different number costs are that predicted. So if we were not to fix the problem in studio, LR, HU, the economizer fault, it would have cost them $26,000 if not fixed. This allows them to prioritize what they're fixing, also know when it's, going, when it's not working, and go and fix it. Before they had to follow cold calls, hot calls, go there trying to find this problem. Now they're going to the actual problem, knowing what's wrong, and also with the fault detection technology, we can do the most likely problem, or the most likely part that's broken. So they can go with the proper part too, which is speeding up response and also changing the way they think about it. Now this is the top 500 fault savings for the week. As you can see, it adds up. And they're looking to save at least 10% on their overall campus energy costs alone. Now, that's the demo here. I have one last slide to go over the results of the deployment as it is now. So I'm going to hand over control. Thank you. Uh, if you can uh, ex move it one more slide forward. Thank you. So from the deployment, they were able to save 6 to 10% of their energy costs and replace a five-year retro commissioning cycle. The five-year retro commissioning cycle would typically, every five years, they would be able to touch one building and do, for all intents and purposes, an energy audit on the building. They would go through and try to fix everything they found. With that, you have a curve in the graph here, much like the blue jagged one. You lose efficiency over the time, and then it bumps up with the commissioning, but it still loses the efficiency. It's a constant downward spiral, spiral until you have to replace a lot of this equipment inside the building. By implementing a fault detection type system, you're able to increase that efficiency constantly. You get this purple curve here, where you're actually going there, fixing the problems, and by able to find the certain problems, you're also able to fix cascading problems or domino problems that because that's broken, that's causing this. So you improve the efficiency overall. It's also changed the way they've thought about deploy, uh, uh, maintenance. They actually no longer just look at cold calls, hot call response time. Now they're actually critically thinking how to save energy, which goes a lot to what Dave was saying is 
you need the buy-in from upper management, and you also need this dedication, this thought process, to try to figure out where it, it, the energy is saving. The pretty pictures that I showed you are just pretty pictures unless you have the people on the ground working hard, they have the right systems hooked up, and they're ready to take action and think about it. Also with this, because they were able to show the savings, Future Sound is giving them a buyback product project. They actually have uh, fully funded the software. So this ROI is actually a little bit less than what it is here now. So they've actually been able to bring it down to almost a, uh, a year's ROI. And that is the completion of my section. I'll hand it back over to uh, Miles. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, Greg, uh, thank you again for your, uh, for your part of that um, presentation. And uh, thanks both Greg and Dave. Uh, and I want to uh, remind our audience out there that uh, you can uh, submit questions uh, for either of the two panelists. Uh, and we will try to uh, try to answer uh, as many as we can. We've got uh, a pretty good uh, pretty good amount of time left here, so um, just go ahead and type your questions in, and uh, we will uh, we will try to get to those. A uh, couple of questions, I guess, to kind of uh, uh, start off with here. I think uh, both of you guys emphasized and, and, and stressed this point that uh, in order for um, in order for this to work uh, in order for anybody to realize uh, energy savings it really does does seem to to uh, require a real change in mindset uh, for it uh, to work and it almost seems like you need buy-in from from basically every level of your of your company um, is that I mean would you characterize that as being true generally speaking both you guys can kind of um, look at that, or maybe you can talk about, uh, you know, working working with customers and kind of seeing, uh, you know, seeing where it really worked and where it kind of lagged a bit. Yeah, it, you know, I can I, give me a second to address that first. Um, sure. That buy-in is so important. It's 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 funny because Mitsubishi is a pretty large organization, and our building in Japan, um, very very committed to energy savings, and in at the corporate headquarters, they invested um, a fair amount of money, installed a lot of software and a lot of meters, and have turned that building into one of the most energy efficient um, buildings in the country there. And here in the United States, we were like, oh, yeah, OK, let's take advantage of that. And we weren't doing it in our own building. What we did, we implemented it earlier this year in our own building. We're using the iconic software for the visualization. And we're doing demand management and actually cutting our utility bills dramatically. Um, just by taking our own medicine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, it does, it, you know, not only does it take buy-in from all levels of the organization, but I think you have to really demonstrate your commitment. Um, you know, we're here to help customers do this. I know Greg's company is there to help customers do it. We have to be doing it ourselves first so that we can show, you know, our commitment and our buy-in, and I think that's, I think that's important. Okay. Yeah. Good point, Greg. Any uh, you want to chime in on that uh, on that question at all? Or, I could or? chime in a little bit, and uh, we have a saying here for that, Dave. It's eat our own dog food. If we're not willing to try it ourselves, then why should we tell our customers to? And that's a, it's a big thing here too. Um, yeah, it takes a lot of buy-in. Is the way I look at the steps is to get the information available, and once and Iconix is a tool for that. And then once you have that information available, you have to be ready to make the decisions and make actions on that. Mm -hmm. If you're not ready to make actions on it, you're not going to make any savings. So. Okay. Um, so, um, so a slightly different question here. Uh, so, uh, the example, Greg, that you that you looked at uh, involved uh, Microsoft, and, and which is a, which is a you know fairly big uh, operation to put it lightly, I guess. Um, how does um, <clears throat> Do you find that most of your customers are kind of in that in that um, larger space, or are they, uh, you know, uh, individual factories or uh, uh, manufacturing plants, or you know, something something um, something like that? And also, how does it? Uh, I guess how does that differ maybe from you know from working with a with a company like Microsoft that has you know labs and it has office you know plenty of offices and all that kind of stuff? Is there a uh, is there a big difference, or is it pretty much uh, uh, you know, you're you're gathering pretty much the same kind of data, but it's just you know, it's it's just a, a different type of plant, I guess. Well, for, um, in the building space, you, you do need a sizable uh, footprint really to kind of see the savings and and to make the the software viable. 
Um, on an individual, on a, a more a manufacturing basis, uh, it can be anything from a, a plant on up. Uh, I know a story of uh, a plant where we implemented our software, and it was back during the uh, the uh, 2007 with the ec economic crisis and everything. And this company made um, made uh, reinforced uh, storm windows, mm -hmm. and they were running the plant. 24/7, uh, seven days a week, still not getting capacity, and they were thinking of buying, a, of opening a new plant. They implemented the software, and they were about, they weren't going to go with us. So we we went, uh, we said, let's put it on a line and see. They were having a problem where they had to shut it down every 12 hours. They they had to shut down the whole manufacturing process to fix one or two filaments. Mm -hmm. Once the software was implemented, they were able to predict and find out where the different filaments were going to go down and only take down a section of the line at the time. So they were able to keep uh, producing even when they did, uh, it, it, they were able to keep producing even when they should have been, uh, when they were supposed to shut it down like before. Now they can mm -hmm. produce it running. So they've taken it from a 24-7 operation and were able to narrow it down to five days a week, two shifts, and they didn't even need the new plan anymore by implementing mm -hmm. the software and VLAN. And that's just one plan. That was able to implement it and, and, and get the savings. Okay. So we're getting a, a sizable savings out of that. Okay. Um, all right. Well, um, we have a question here for uh, for Greg, uh, and it's a question about um, it says what is the uh, recommendation to incorporate multi-utility uh, by that meaning steam, natural gas, um, compressed air, uh, along with uh, electricity at the system line level with a large manufacturing site. Production data significant, but with varying schedule changes, um, trying to lay out the framework for developing the executive and operator level dashboard. Hmm. So let me see if uh, I felt like there were multiple questions there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, well, I guess the first part dealt with uh, multi utility. So it was kind of looking at you know if you get steam and natural gas and uh, uh, compressed air along with um, electricity at the system line level, at the larger uh, manufacturing site. So how would you, how would you um, go about uh, incorporating that kind, uh, we, of a, that kind of a setup? Yeah. Well, we can pull in multiple different uh, product type meters. So we pull in the different meters, and we have a, a way of licensing where we license by meter. So once you have the information and a quantity in, then you just need a rate of costing that you can add to it. And then once you have that, the rates and the costing, you can pull that into a unified charging. Now, you can also organize it with the asset tree. What we can organize it is by plant, by um, by assembly line, if the degree of monitoring is there. We also have the capability of doing a uh, hypothetical meter, a virtual meter, where in the HVAC world, we're able to run and say the air in, the air out, and the change in the delta, we can then gauge how much energy is being consumed, and then if you have a rate, you can charge it to that. So having the individual virtual meters, that also adds a degree of capability to be able to pinpoint that's a different assembly line. So we can pull all the information in, and then it's just depending on how we want to organize the asset structure to be able to visualize and allow the drill downs of the software. Okay. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, well, we can, uh, you know, if uh, uh, if at any time anyone feels like putting a follow-up question up there, that's that's uh, that's fine too. So it looks like we're doing pretty good with time. So, uh, and actually, I was gonna um, was gonna put out another follow-up question there uh, in relation to your answer there, uh, and maybe um, uh, maybe David can can speak to this because he didn't mention this uh, during during his part, uh, but. Um, uh, what uh, what role do the the kind of variable rates charged uh, by by the uh, uh, you know uh, power companies have in that? I mean, I know that uh, you know that uh, that there's not one flat rate that all their that all of their customers get charged. So is that um, uh, is that a part of that energy auditing process yes. uh, that you do with your with your customers as well? Absolutely, and yeah, that's the very first thing we do is make sure. Um, we ensure that they're paying the proper rate. Uh, sometimes you can have, depending on the utility, you have different rates for different times of the day. Even um, you know, if you're uh, a, a good example, um, a company I was working with uh, ran 24/7, but the company up 
stream of the utility um, only ran uh, two shifts. Mm -hmm. And it actually, um, the company that was running 24-7 was getting billed at, at um, during the third shift, they were getting billed at the same rate as they would have during the first and second shift, but because this other large company did not operate during third shift, um, they should have been paying less mm -hmm. during those hours. And it, you know, so that's the very first thing you know we look at is we look at the bill and we make sure that you know you're you're actually you know paying what you should be paying. Mm -hmm. if and um, did I answer that question? Mm -hmm. And that makes a, I mean, that makes a big difference, doesn't it? I mean, that's, you know, as you said, that's one of the first places that you start, so. It's, yeah, if you don't, well, it's, it's the, um, where the easiest money is, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Um, we've got another question here for, uh, for David, looks like. Uh, so this is, um, uh, it says, how did you get success for uh, behavior changes on, on the floor? Dollar indicators at an operator level may not seem like an overwhelming number at the unit op, even if the whole utility budget for the entire site is uh, extremely large. Did you did you catch that? Yeah, yeah, that's that's actually um, where I think we can. You know, I, I it, everybody remember when we did Six Sigma, you know, continuous mm -hmm. improvement, and, sure. and we put up giant end on boards and showed production rates and failure rates and downtime and uptime and we empowered everybody within the factory to find ways, you know, to, um, you know, improve our productivity. Mm -hmm. This is the same thing. This is no different. So we can put, by putting meters and knowing what the bill rates are at the line level, at the machine level, and then um, using HMIs or using LED boards or, you know, even using a whiteboard and writing it down, you know, and incentivizing um, and in empowering, you know, so you have when you have that factory meeting or that line meeting, you know, you sit down and you say, hey, one of our goals today is find or our, this week or this month is to find a way to reduce our energy consumption by another five percent. Mm -hmm. Anybody got any ideas? This mm -hmm. is where the innovation happens, and and it's easy to do. These meters are very inexpensive. They're very easy to install, um, and you know, you can use uh, the Iconic software if you're using it as a, like an executive dashboard. It can also serve information up, or you can use an HMI with its web server to serve it up to a larger board. There's there's a, a, a very large myriad of different ways of empowering the the person on the line, mm -hmm. and, and it's really not that hard. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> about you, Greg? Do you have any? Uh, do you like chiming in there at all, or? The visualization, yeah, it, it, it takes putting it out on a board, and we've done a number of different plants we're putting on the board, and you get a reaction. If people can see that their decisions have changed or their actions have changed the, the needle a little bit, uh, it just breeds more more commitment and uh, more savings because they'll keep on working towards it. Mm -hmm. okay. I, was, uh, I, I just got a text from one of my colleagues at uh, Mitsubishi. He, he's asking me to point out that and, it, and I'm pretty sure Greg brought this up with his software, staging the equipment at startup, at shift startup. You know, and that's, that's a, a simple example of how the operators can make a tremendous savings over a month for a facility, and that is rather than turn everything on at once, you know, come up with a startup procedure and a shutdown procedure that, that um, lowers the peak demand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that was, uh, was going to be... Uh, uh, there was another question similar to that, I guess, which is, uh, you know, what other ways can you manage the 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 those peaks that we saw on those on those uh, on those graphs? I mean, one of them, one of the things that you mentioned was um, using um, VFDs, and you know, maybe there's some there's some other methods too, which 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 seems like a pretty straightforward way, and 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 which will which which carries a pretty sizable benefit with it too. And yeah, this. You know, there's there's the simple things like the VFDs in place of motor starters. This stage startup is a real big deal. Mm -hmm. um, putting on uh, filters so that the feedback, you know, um, doesn't you know doesn't. Um, putting in capacitive banks and things like that, both for filtering and for smoothing out the energy spikes or demand spikes. I mean, mm -hmm. um, the, the, really in the energy audit, in a proper audit. Um, some of that will be in the recommendations mm -hmm. because when they do the audit, they 
they don't just measure your energy consumption over time. They actually observe the facility and how it operates, and and it's going back to behavioral changes. Okay. You know, they're looking for you know, no cost investments, you know, to reduce your energy, and that's by providing behavioral change um, recommendations. Okay. Uh, and as as uh, it's kind of a follow up to that, uh, or kind of dovetails nicely. Uh, there's another question here about uh, was displaying the number uh, sufficient to gain buy-in, or did you have to provide action plans or uh, troubleshooting guides to help them know uh, what to go after? I think that kind of goes oh. goes along with what you were just saying there too. Yeah, you know, um, developing action plans or troubleshooting guides. It's it's the other way around. It really should be coming from the operators, uh -huh. um, making the recommendations. You, you know, I mean that's how that's how I did it when I worked on the factory floor. You know, it, it, I, I looked to the operators to give me suggestions and action plans and troubleshooting guides that became best practices to use throughout the facility. Mm -hmm. So if you're empowering, you know, and empowerment, come on, we don't we don't work for free. Empowerment comes with some sort of incentive. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, it, it, it might be a free lunch, it might be the day off, I don't know, whatever works in your facility, but really it's the people working on the equipment that are, that are going to come up with some really, really innovative ideas, but you got to let them know that you're asking for it and that, and that they've got the ability to provide suggestions and try things. All right, okay. Um, Greg, uh, any uh, care to chime in at all, or any uh, anything from your uh, uh, from your end that you've seen that works or doesn't work? Or oh yeah, I've I've mostly been working on a, a few college campuses and stuff, and it does need that a little incentive added to it. Um, but the bill is off a little bit of Dave's also is is what these these tools allow them to see is where the problems are, and then to pull in the operators who know the system and have worked with it every day is where you really get the true synergy with it. You give them a task and they'll, they'll come up with the solution. Uh, and I, I know Dave probably seen that more than I have. Uh, on the college campuses, do a, on, back to that one, is it typically a free lunch or some free food or usually help them to, to do it or just being named as like the best hall helps a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, well good. Um, no, we've, all, we've come uh, to the to the uh, to the end here really so uh, if there uh, if there aren't any questions uh, any more questions um, maybe we'll go ahead and, and wrap this up then I just want to uh, thank everyone uh, once again first of all obviously to thank uh, Dave and and uh, Greg for uh, for sharing their knowledge and insights with us here today uh, and I also want to uh, uh, remind everyone that uh, this webinar you can find it at uh, designerworldonline.com, and everybody who has registered for the webinar will also get a copy of it in their email as well. Uh, we have the, the uh, Twitter hashtag up there as well, hashtag DWWebinar. Uh, and you can connect with, uh, with us. You can connect with Dave and Gregory. As you saw earlier, there's, uh, their, their contact info there will be part of the, the uh, webinar presentation that you'll get. So you can, uh, you'll have their email contact, their, their phone numbers as well. You can also contact us as well. You can follow us on Twitter at um, uh, the, our handle there is at um, Design World. You can also like us on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. We have a uh, Design World group, and we're on YouTube as well. So we are, we are everywhere, or at least almost everywhere. So um, once again, thank you, everybody, for, um, for showing up today. And thank you, uh, Greg and Dave, again, for a, uh, for a great job. Thank you, Miles. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.